I went on to Clemson. I met my husband my very first weekend there. We dated for seven years. We've been married for 13. I graduated from Clemson with a degree in accounting, and I went on to Charlotte, became a corporate accounting executive there for a couple of years, and then I came back home to the family business. The one thing we consistently noticed in our family business, time and time again, was how hard it was to make a dollar and how easy it was for government to take it. We got very frustrated. My parents always said, don't complain about it, do something about it. So I decided to run for the state house. I had never been politically active, was not involved in party politics, and ended up defeating the longest serving legislator in a Republican primary. <laughs> and I've spent the last six years trying to prove to the people of Lexington County that they made a good decision. When I got to the state house, I saw some things that I liked and I saw some things that I didn't. But what I can tell you we are facing on the state level, what we continue to face on the federal level, is that government has no value for a dollar. They don't understand that people paid this money in. They don't understand that how they spend it matters. When I got there in 2005, we had a $4 billion budget. 2006, South Carolina had a $5 billion budget. In 2007, we had a $6 billion budget. Government grew by a billion dollars a year, and you didn't feel it. I continued to fight wasteful spending, but I noticed that there were more and more bills that were crossing the desk that were being passed by a voice vote. Legislators weren't putting their name up their votes. And all I can tell you is as an accountant, all I saw were dollar signs. Every time a bill passed, I saw dollar signs, and I knew we were growing government, and you couldn't see the spending habits of your legislators. But it all came to light one day when we were focused on a bill that dealt with the cost of living increases for state employees and retirees. At the last minute, a legislator slipped in an amendment that would give legislators retirement perks. Not uncommon. They will do that, but I think you should know exactly who voted for it and who voted against it. But instead, it was read across the desk, passed overwhelmingly by a voice vote, and to this day you cannot find one legislator that says they voted themselves a pay raise. I got very upset. The next day I said any, said, introduced a bill that said anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate is important enough for you to know how your legislator voted. There was a report that came out that year. Of all the bills passed in the South Carolina House, only 8% were on the record. Of all the bills passed in the South Carolina Senate, only 1% was on the record. So my question to you is, if you didn't know how your House member voted 92% of the time, if you didn't know how your Senator voted 99% of the time, how'd you know who to vote for when you went to the polls? Because you didn't. This is the painful part. I went to my Republican leadership. I said, we should do this. This will make us accountable. The people will start to trust us again. And my leadership said, put the bill away. We don't need to have it. We will decide what the public needs to see and what they don't. To put all this into perspective, I want to tell you about my legislative career. My first year in office, I was chairman of the freshman class. My second year, I was named majority whip. My third year, I was put on a powerful business committee. And my fourth year, I was subcommittee chair of banking. The year that I wouldn't put the bill away, the year that I fought to make legislators vote on the record, they stripped me of everything. Now, I tell you that not because I was a victim of the process. I was very aware that if I pushed forward, there would be punishment to pay. But while they were trying to show my colleagues, this is what we do to someone that steps out of line, I was trying to show my colleagues, this is what happens when we step out of line. I'm still strong. I'm still standing. I was very aware of who I worked for, and it wasn't anyone in that state house. Right. The good news is, about three or four weeks ago, after two years of a lot of bruises, um, we finally passed overwhelmingly in the House that every single bill had to be on the record. So that was great news for us, but we have one more hurdle. It is the Senate. And I will tell you that um, I had to testify in front of the Senate this past week, and they are now, after every excuse of money and time and everything else, now the Senate is claiming that it is unconstitutional for you to know how your legislators vote. And so I will ask you to please contact your Senator. Um, tell them that these votes belong to you and that we will not stop until we make sure it is permanent law that every single bill is on the record. It's very important. It's not just legislative votes on the record I want to see. I can tell you when I went to Columbia, I was not for term limits. I am absolutely for term limits now. We have to have them. Because what happened to me is not uncommon. 
Legislators go to Columbia with the best of intentions, but along the way they get broken. They're told not to step out of line, they're threatened with committee assignments, so they get quiet. The problem is those serving on the high finance committees, they're not accountants, they're not finance managers, they're not people used to managing money. They're those that got quiet, did what they were told, and so there are only two or three people managing the entire state budget. If we turn around and put term limits in place, we will have fresh faces, fresh voices, fresh ideas working for the people of this state and not the power of the legislature. Next, I want to make sure that we have all of our budgets and all of our spending online. You are busy and will probably never look at it, but if they know you can see it, they'll have to behave with how they spend it. I compare it to a teacher in the classroom. When the teacher's in the classroom, the kids are fine. When the teacher walks out of the classroom, what happens? The kids cut up a little bit. Not because they're bad kids, but because they can. I want you to be the teacher in the classroom. I want you to see how every dollar is spent in Columbia. And then Molly, I'll tell you, I represent Lexington County for $10,000 a year. I want income disclosures on all of our legislators in the state of South Carolina. Because when you see who's paying your legislators, you will start to see why policy has moved the way it has in this state. When we put income disclosures in place, two things will happen. One, legislators will know when to recuse themselves from votes they shouldn't be taking. And two, we will start to see policy move in South Carolina that benefits the people and the businesses of the state and not the wallets of the legislators that represent them. So when we talk about wasteful spending, when we talk about good government, let's look at where we are right now. We have 12% unemployment in the state. We have got to stop passing government-friendly legislation and start passing business-friendly legislation. As an accountant, I can tell you we have one of the most band-aided tax structures in the country. We need to look at every single tax. We need to look at every single fee, because a fee is a tax, and we need to look at every single exemption. The very first thing we need to do is eliminate the small business income tax. Because when you give businesses cash flow, when you give businesses profit margin, what's the first thing they do? They hire people. They invest back into their state. The second thing we need to do is we need to reduce the personal income tax towards elimination. So what happens is all of those people don't turn around and go to Florida. They stop and they invest their dollars here. When we create South Carolina into a business, competitive, friendly environment, we will start to see jobs come. We will start to see companies come. It's things like workers' comp reform and tort reform and tax reform. You know, everybody's celebrating Boeing. Boeing was a great win to South Carolina. But we don't need a Boeing and a BMW every 20 years. Let's basically look at why Boeing came. They came for two reasons. One, because we're a right-to-work state. We keep the unions out, and we need to stay that way. But two, because we gave them tax incentives. 95% of our economy is small business. Why aren't we taking care of the small businesses we already have? <laughs> when you take care of the small businesses you already have, when you create that strong competitive business environment, companies will come here not because we smile and take the dinner, but because it makes sense to their bottom line and it makes sense to their profit margin. So I know I've thrown a lot at you, and I certainly welcome your questions, but I will close by telling you this. I am a woman that understands that through the grace of God, with him all things are possible. I am the daughter of parents that reminded us every day how blessed we were to live in this country. I am the sister of a man who fought in Desert Storm, and I still remember what it was like when we didn't know if he'd come home. I am the wife of a husband that puts on a military uniform every day and loves his job. I am the mother of two children in public schools, and I care about what their education looks like. And I care about what kind of government they're going to have. But I'm an accountant, a small business person, and a legislator that knows what good government is. And I want the people of the state to know what that feels like. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. If you're looking for a candidate that before she spends a dollar of government money, she will realize that it came from a family like yours. I happen to be down there at that subcommittee meeting. And I can tell you, if you're looking for a candidate that has a spine of steel, <laughs> I had no intentions of speaking at that Senate hearing because I, I knew they had testimony and I really wanted the people to be able to speak. When I saw the arrogance of those senators, when I saw how they were treating you, I was absolutely furious that I could not take it anymore. And so getting up there was me probably being overpassionate, but I will never let them stomp on you like that, ever. I mean, that is, they work for you. Every day of the week they work for you, and they are forgetting that. And I will tell you, we are long past the days where we elect people because they look good in the picture or hold a baby well. If they are not going to fight for you, we don't need to have them. And we really need to make sure that we get the right people in office. It's not about Republicans anymore. It is truly about conservatives.